Hello, all you lovely people out there. How are you all doing? I'm Kate Hill, and I am here to give you the best commentary about our property markets. Tina Howes is with me from Smartmove, one of Australia's leading and award-winning mortgage brokers. We are giving you a whole series explaining all things property finance, so stay tuned. Hi, Tina. Hi, Kate. Hello. So, everybody, we are doing a series, as per my introduction, about various aspects of borrowing money to buy property. And we all know and we've all heard the term that when we go to borrow money to buy a property, we've all heard the term of borrowing capacity. So, Tina, explain to us what borrowing capacity actually is. What does it mean? <laughs> okay, so there's two terms you probably hear a lot. That's borrowing capacity and serviceability. Mm. It's essentially how much money the bank is prepared to lend you, okay? It's as simple as that. Borrowing capacity is not the purchase price. It is the loan amount that that lender is prepared to lend to you, okay? Mm. So when we're looking at the borrowing capacity, every lender has a different assessment of, of how they come up with that borrowing capacity figure. Mm. Um, and that comes down to the lender's credit policy and guidelines. Okay. Yes, yes. So I guess following on from that, I, I mean, I know the answer to this, but um, I think it's worth asking you to explain this, that not every lender assesses you the same way. So your borrowing capacity can be different from one lender to the next, yep. which is why it's so important not to just yep. walk into a bank to actually yeah. talk to a broker. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So essentially, if we were to break it right down, how does a bank come up with that borrowing capacity yeah. figure? Yeah. It's a function of all of your income sources. So whether that's PAYG, mm. self-employed, commissions, bonuses, rental income, um, uh, child support, whatever that income is, less your living expenses that are declared, mm. less your financial commitments, mm. okay? Yeah. Now, those three things will then produce, a, I guess, a, a cash surplus figure that is then available to service a potential new borrowing. Now, that new loan is assessed at a higher interest rate than what the lender's interest, what the actual interest rate is. So all of those functions in that equation, mm. every lender has a different policy mm. and a different guideline of what number they choose to use. Mm. So for example, if you're receiving bonuses, some lenders will take the most recent years, some will take the lower of the last two years, others will take 60% of the average of the last two years. So every lender has a different nuance in regards to how they treat that income. Mm. And that's why it's so crucial that if you're looking at absolutely maximising your borrowing capacity, that you want to chat to a broker that have, has access to multiple lenders mm. because then mm. they're able to match your particular circumstances to the lender that's able to meet those needs. Right. Okay. And so why not to get sort of too into this really, but I just think it's interesting. Why would one lender assess those things differently to another? What would be the reasons behind that? Oh, I guess risk appetite. Yeah. Target market. Mm. Every bank will have its niches. Mm. Um, if they all did exactly the same thing and offered every single interest rate the same, mm. every single product the same, and every single credit policy the same, there would be very little to distinguish them. Mm. So they need to have a point of differentiation. Yeah. And I guess every lender decides, okay, well, what market do we want to play in? So one lender, for example, really targets themselves to high net worth individuals with mm. lots of equity in their properties, mm. super low interest rates for that. Uh, they want to deal with professionals largely. And mm. as a result of that, they might have a more lenient bonus policy, for example, so that they can look at the most recent year's bonus in isolation. Mm. And that, that can skew that type of clientele towards that. 
that mm. particular lender. Okay. And we've heard a lot, and you and I did a video about this quite recently. Explain to us how the debt to income ratio uh, comes into play here. How is okay. that relevant? So let's say you have a, an owner-occupied principal and interest loan uh, with an interest rate of 2.5%, for example. The bank doesn't just put that 2.5% in. Um, it will add a buffer in there, which recently that got increased to 3%. Yes. Yeah. Now, again, each lender might choose a different buffer on top of that loan. Mm. Um, so that's called the assessment rate. Now, that assessment rate gives a bit of buffer in the event that interest rates rise throughout your 30-year loan term. Now, recent, in recent times, banks also implemented what they call a DTI, debt-to-income ratio, as another mechanism to, I guess, control the amount of leverage or debt that an individual has. And it's essentially a ratio of how much debt you have in relation to your income, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, generally speaking, under six times is a really comfortable level. Yeah. Once it gets over six times, um, there are certain lenders that may actually not participate at all mm -hmm. or have restrictions depending mm -hmm. on if you're owner-occupied mm -hmm. or investor. Um, there are some lenders that, you know, will cap out at seven times, others nine times. Mm -hmm. So we will start to hear more and more about this DTI. It was threatened that they would actually bring in a cap on DTI recently mm -hmm. as a way of trying to, I guess, take some heat out of the property market mm -hmm. and stop people from getting themselves into too much debt, mm -hmm. which could be disastrous if interest rates rapidly rise. Yeah. Um, the, the authorities decided not to go too high and too hard on that, mm -hmm. choosing to use that assessment rate mechanism as a lever instead. So instead of having a, a two and a half um, rate buffer over the actual interest rate, they chose to increase that to 3%, yeah. which in the, the scheme of things is a much softer income than just a blanket rule of six times debt to income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So is there a way that you can increase your borrowing capacity? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Um, so depending on your circumstances, but there are a couple of levers that are very common. Um, and often when I'm speaking to, to people that have done a bit of Google searching on yeah. getting a loan, yeah. credit cards, for example. Yeah. So even if you have a credit card, pay it off in full or mm. never use it, mm. the lender is required to treat that credit card as yeah. though it's fully drawn yeah. because tomorrow you could go out you and go, go crazy. Mo yeah. Motorbike, whatever it may be, overseas yeah. trip, now that we can all do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so reducing those credit card limits or cancelling those credit cards uh, is something that can certainly um, increase your borrowing capacity. Mm. Um, I would say don't go and close credit cards before you go and talk to your broker or bank. Um, it's possible to approve something subject to you reducing those cards. Yeah. Because potentially if you get a pre-approval and you don't actually need to use that capacity, then you may not need to close that card or reduce that card. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, Another way is potentially consolidating debts. So if you have car finance or a personal loan, mm. um, generally those loans have a very large repayment in proportion to the amount of debt that is held there. Mm. So potentially consolidating those loans or if you have cash, using those to pay that out might actually have a significant impact on your borrowing capacity. Mm -hmm. And again, don't go and do any of that first without talking to an advisor Yeah. Um, because potentially there's tax implications as well. For example, a motor mm. vehicle where you're claiming the interest or the repayments as a deduction. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that is certainly something that um, working with clients, you have good success with. Mm. And probably the third point is living expenses. Yeah. Now, there are some lenders will actually receive all of your bank statements over the last three months and then use whatever you've spent money on as your average living expenses. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so for those particular lenders, then potentially by reining in your living costs and tightening back on your spending in the period leading up to an application, that can have an impact in terms of increasing your borrowing capacity. Mm -hmm. For those lenders, aside from that, that, that go with your declared expenses, then there is an element of checking bank statements still and doing your due diligence and mm. making sure you're declaring mm. all your expenses. 
Um, but there may be some ability for you to go, you know, particularly if you're about to do a big outlay and a big purchase um, on a new investment property or a new home, mm. um, then to go through your, your expenses and say, well, actually, this is a bit surplus to requirements. We don't need this. Let's look at scaling that back. Let's cancel that. Let's cancel this subscription. Mm. This is if I do zip um after pay whatever they're called um yeah so yeah. that that is a, also a mechanism mm -hmm. that you can use to increase your borrowing capacity mm -hmm. so tina um I, I think there's always a a big difference between an amount that the bank will lend you an amount that you might want to borrow if you see what I mean, right? So there's a yeah. bit of a difference there. So is there anything else, I guess, in terms of that borrowing capacity that you would, that you, you have some sort of some ideas and some comments and advice for us on that subject? Yeah, yeah, look, um, there is definitely how much the bank will lend you. Yeah. And then there is what you're prepared to borrow and yes. how much you're comfortable with. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Now, many people, when they hear what, particularly if we're talking upper end yeah. borrowing capacity, mm. many people will fall off their chair when they mm. hear, wow, the bank will lend me that much. The yeah. repayments are this much. Yeah. And that's largely a function of when we look at our living expenses, we tend to look at all those fixed items with a bit of a little bit of recreation and so mm. forth in there. Mm. But it's very easy to forget about those things in life that, you know, the car breaks down or the fridge breaks down or we like to go on a big overseas holiday every now, mm. now and then. We have gifts, we have weddings, we have outlays. Um, we have future planned um, annual leave where we're going to travel the world for a year or we're going to take time off to have a child and then we have mm. additional expenses. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important when you're doing your, your budget and you're looking at how much you're going to borrow that you do actually make allowances for all those items. Yes. Um, and yeah. I always say put a buffer into what the actual repayments are yeah. versus what potentially rates could be mm. if interest rates go up. Yeah. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, yeah. Like I say, I mean, I say that to clients all the time, big difference between, yeah. you know, what, um, what the bank will lend you and what, you know, you might not be, like you said, you might not be comfortable yeah. Yeah. borrowing that whole amount. Um, yes. I think that's a really important decision to make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Tina. Yeah. I think we've had You're a good discussion about borrowing capacity. Um, lots more videos about all things property finance to come and we will see you all soon. Bye. I really hope that you found all of that useful. Tina is a mind of information. She and I will bring you lots, lots more videos explaining all things property finance. Don't forget to leave us a comment and a question. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and also just give us a little like on the video if you are enjoying the free content. And we will see you really soon. Bye.